I'm Walter Isaacson of the Aspen Institute, and I'm here to welcome you to the second annual Spotlight Health. When the Institute was founded more than 65 years ago, it was founded to promote the concept of mind, body, and spirit, as Walter Pepka, Mortimer Adler, and others of the founders put it. There is no topic that stands better at the intersection of mind, body, and spirit than the ones we'll be discussing in the next three days. In this Spotlight Health part of the Aspen Ideas Festival, which began two years ago when we realized that everybody who came to Aspen Ideas Festival were mainly interested in the health sessions, so we expanded Ideas Festival to have the spotlight on health. We try to bring together people across a variety of sectors. And by that, I don't just mean uh, the insurers and the hospitals. I mean things like artists, entrepreneurs, business people, policy makers, scientists, researchers, and all who care about what is going to be the integrated system of health that we have in our country today. We also hope to make this global with Peggy Clark's help. She keeps pushing in that, not simply because what we do in this country can help people around the world, but what happens in the backyard halfway around the world can be informative and helpful and help inform our ability to do health care better. For the, for the past 50 years, innovation and entrepreneurship have been pretty much focused on the information technology re uh, revolution, on bits and bytes, on social networks, on IT. But for the next 50 years, the revolution is going to be focused on the life sciences. It's going to involve the, uh, the intersection of information technology and the life sciences. It's going to involve data science and targeted therapy, the Internet of Things and the cloud and biotechnology and targeted uh, treatments are all going to come together, but only if we figure out how to do it right. It'll take smart policies, but also smart ethics, smart moral thinking. Uh, already today, we see some of the clashes where things like HIPAA, which was designed for a previous era, stand in the way of creating great databases and great understandings of how we can do medicine. We have to not only change the policies, but explain to everybody so everybody understands concepts of both uh, sharing and data, but also of privacy and respect. And also, as of about six or seven hours ago, we know that the next 10 years are going to be reshaped by the Affordable Care Act. When uh, Ruth and Peggy spoke to the members of the Supreme Court and asked to have it done, they actually tried to get the decision done tomorrow morning. But um, the Chief Justice Roberts said to Ruth, we actually do decisions on Thursday, but we'll do it the day the health forum begins. <laughs> uh, because of that, it's not in your program, but as you would expect, we have a special session on it at 8 tomorrow morning in place of the one about Congress. So at 8 a.m. in the Door Hosier building in the McNulty room, the big room where some of you were uh, listening to Dan Glickman and Corby, and Peggy Hamburg just a few minutes ago. We are going to have a discussion involving the whole room, but also led by five, the five people who I think know the Affordable Care Act as well as anybody in this nation. Tom Daschle, Nancy Ann DeParle, who of course uh, shepherded in the White House, Bill Frist, Kathleen Sebelius, and Henry Waxman. So that'll start off tomorrow morning, and that'll lay the ground for what I think is going to be not just a way of making sure that more and more people get covered, but every time I've talked to people who either run insurance or hospitals or medical practice and all, it is going to change over the next 10 years the way we deliver and the way we think about health care. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Peggy Clark but also thank the people who put this together, 
Ruth, I've already said about Ruth Katz. Katie Dressler, where's Katie? <laughs> Brita Stevenson, who I saw there. And Fran Marie Kennedy, and many, many others. So with that, Peggy, take it over. Thanks, Walter. Hello, Spotlight Health 2015. Great. I'm delighted to welcome you here today. I'm Peggy Clark, Executive Director of Aspen Global Health and Development, together with my colleague Ruth Katz. Ruth, stand up. One of the greatest people to work with in the world. We've put together an amazing Spotlight Health program for you this year. Many of you have traveled far to join us here today at the preeminent creative forum on health in the world. There's no single issue that touches each of us as closely and as deeply as health. Whether we've, each of us have cared for a loved one, held the hand of someone at the end of their life, worked to develop drugs or technology, worried about our own health or worried about the health of our community, health affects us all. At Spotlight Health, we take health out of the box. We connect it to the economy, to the arts, to climate change, to design, to technology. Together, we'll explore new ideas, we'll push the boundaries of our thinking, and we'll move new solutions forward. Together, we represent more than 30 countries and leading th thinkers and experts from across the world. And I'm especially decided to, decided to tell you that we are joined by more than 100 scholars here at Spotlight Health. <laughs> can I ask all of these scholars to stand up, please, and we can give them a round of applause. <laughs> Woo! These young individuals are really at the leading, leading edge of change. Sitting next to you right now is an amazing person. The person to your right may be the person who beat back Ebola in Liberia. The person on your left may be a policymaker who helped write parts of the Affordable Care Act. Another person beside you maybe is the person who wiped smallpox off the face of the earth. Beside you may be one of five former heads of Health and Human Services. Sitting next to you may be Elmo. Elmo really is here at Spotlight Health. <laughs> Sitting next to you may be the first investor in the first mobile phone company for health in the world. So as you walk the campus the next few days, say hello to the person beside you. I promise you will learn something new and you will regain your sense of faith in humanity. This year's theme is smart solutions to the world's toughest challenges, and we're gonna tackle many of those. Gun violence, violence against women, pandemics, reaching the poor with health care. Bold and brave thinkers are here with you together to push progress on all of these fronts. I'm thrilled to be here with you. I'm thrilled to welcome you and ask you to open your minds and your hearts to listen and to work together and bring forward solutions to challenges in health to benefit us all. Thank you very much. Now let's begin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's kick off Spotlight Health with some really amazing big ideas from just 10 of the most amazing people who are here with you today. BJ. Thank you, Peg. Um, hello, everybody. I just got very nervous. If you're a physician, please know I'm full code. Um, um, OK, so um, I feel that uh, healthcare is heading for a, oh, sorry, I'm BJ Miller. <laughs> I'm, <clears throat> hi, Peg. I'm a hospice and palliative care physician from San Francisco. My main job is as executive director of the Zen Hospice Project. Mm. OK, so I feel that healthcare is heading for sort of a postmodern period. That is to say, I don't think we really need uh, anything new so much as we need to make good on all that we already know. We need to catch up with ourselves. We need to spend some energy on the nitty-gritty logistical bits that gum up the works and get in the way, get, uh, so prevent our solutions from reaching our problems. As a patient and provider, I can yield to Mother Nature Illness, death are normal. But I'll be damned if I will yield to political caprice or red tape. Thank you. 
So what do we know? Well, my field, hospice and palliative medicine, we know a few things. <clears throat> we know that healing is distinct from fixing. So I had some parts that couldn't be fixed, but I'm a whole person, for example. Thank you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And I know that uh, living well, we know that living well and dying well are absolutely entwined. That death is not an anomaly, so we should quit treating it as a failure. Thank you, guys. You're helping me. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, we know that a sense of safety is critical to health. What do we humans do when we feel safe? We get creative. We love. We get open. And we play. So, let's exercise these things that we already know. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I am Barbara Bush. I am the CEO and co-founder of Global Health Corp. Hey. <laughs> Visualize this. In the next 20 years, health systems on the African continent and the rest of the developing world will leapfrog over health systems in the United States and other developed countries in terms of quality, affordability, and functionality. Why? This will be the result of an infusion of radical new leadership from this generation's youth. Youth like the young leaders that I work with every single day at Global Health Corps who put the patient at the center of what they're doing and use design as their skill set. This new generation of leaders will prioritize skills like storytelling and mentorship and traits like empathy and resiliency alongside business acumen and systems thinking. They will be networked thinkers and doers who ensure health systems enlighten and serve rather than fail billions. And this means that in 10 to 15 years, young leaders like Christian Benamana, a 32-year-old Rwandan architect at Mass Design Group, will be the minister, whoever just said yay, I love Mass Design Group. Um, <laughs> will be the Minister of Finance in Rwanda funding smart clinic designs that curbs the spread of disease. Or that Estefania Palomina, currently a 26-year-old Colombian human rights lawyer sitting in the third row, who is currently working on reproductive health with Planned Parenthood in the United States, will be the UN, on High Commissioner, the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights, ensuring that health as a human right is realized in every way. All this while Brian Eustace, a 33-year-old American who's working on the front lines of the Ebola crisis with Partners in Health in Sierra Leone, will be running Partners in Health like a boss. And finally, imagine a world where 32-year-old Aspen New Voices fellow James Arya Natwe will be Uganda's Minister of Health, revitalizing infrastructure, <laughs> revitalizing infrastructure and empowering frontline workers. Many of these four young leaders are in this room. These incredible leaders who think in a fundamentally different way about systems and who contribute to a worldwide sphere of innovation exchange and constant network building will be taking over. And they will be working across silos, disciplines, and cultures to make health a human right. In 20 years, accessing affordable and high quality health care will, like will be like breathing air. Thank you. I'm Stan Littow, and I'm vice president of the IBM company and president of the IBM Foundation. Uh, some exciting things are happening in technology. Perhaps the most exciting at IBM these days is the Watson technology. Maybe you know about it. It won the game show Jeopardy on TV. But Watson is not a game. Watson is an innovative type of technology. And what it does is it takes a massive amount of data in a supercomputer it provides big data and analytics, and then it converts it into natural language. We're using that right now in partnership with Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, the Cleveland Clinic, the Mayo Clinic, to help doctors, cancer doctors, oncologists, provide on a smartphone access to all the clinical trials, all the information that they would need to provide better treatment plans, better diagnosis, and it's working. It's saving lives. Now we're going to take that technology and provide it to teachers to help them become better teachers, giving them access to the best lessons and the best material so that they can improve education and help students achieve. Well, here's the big idea. Community health workers around the world, millions of them, are on the front lines, but they don't have access to mentoring and support and the best information to provide the best care. 
What if the Watson technology available on a smartphone for every community health worker could help them with a mentor, providing them with the best advice, providing them with ongoing support? Yes. With the best research scientists at the IBM Research Labs, the support of philanthropy around the world, the support of international development agencies, we could build an advisor for community health workers. We could make them better at their work. We could make it easier for them to deliver high quality care, and we could save lives. That's a big idea worth putting into practice. I'm Rob Shank, and I'm featured in Abigail Disney's film, The Armor of Light. My big idea is really a small one, but with a big potential to improve our psychological, social, relational, and community health. Launch a micro-movement called My Neighbor, Myself, an intentional, individual lifestyle focused on each of us as individuals, privately, quietly, almost unnoticeably identifying just one person one couple, one family, and the key is that they are as different from you and opposite of you as they can possibly be, and that you and I work very hard with determination over years, even decades if necessary, to learn about that person, that couple, that family, from them as your only source of knowledge about them, to spend time with them, to invite them into your life and to be present in theirs, to suspend presuppositions, prejudice, and contempt, to listen to them more than you talk at them, and to be thankful for them. If you're a person of faith, to pray for them, and if not, to wish them well in every way, and to commit to stick with them until it's no longer possible. This idea will transform you for the better, and it may transform them for the better, and either one or both can transform everything for the better. This idea is about loving your neighbor as yourself, and there's nothing on earth closer to the love of God. As each of us does our little bit to become more relationally healthy, it will make the world we inhabit a healthier place, in a very big way. That's my little, very doable, big idea. Good evening. I'm Jane Gauntlet, and I run a company called Sublime and Ridiculous. And my big idea is that everyone should be pen pals with Saddam Hussein. During the first Gulf War, I was about eight years old, and I had a very clear idea about what was going wrong with the world. I decided that the major problem was that Saddam didn't know the effects of his decisions. Perhaps it was just simply that no one had told him. So I wrote a letter to him to explain what was happening. I now understand why my mother never actually posted it. <laughs> but the truth is that I still believe in that letter and what I thought was important to communicate to Saddam, and that's empathy. I want to be really clear about what I mean by empathy. Empathy is not an act of emotional charity, given by haves to haves not, or by the healthy to the sick. When we think of empathy, quite often what we are really thinking about is sympathy or pity. But empathy is about tapping into something inside ourselves in order to better understand someone else. Nor is empathy only about negative situations. It helps us to design products and allows us to imagine the thrill of being able to fly. It makes us human. I believe that empathy is one of the biggest driving forces behind all of the people and the great ideas you'll see over the course of this festival. Right now, Technology provides us with an opportunity to advance empathy even further. I use virtual reality, technology, and immersive theater to let people inhabit another person's experience for a few minutes. Through my work in health, I try to get leaders, decision makers, doctors, and families as close as possible to first-hand experience. 
I try to cultivate empathy for people in situations that are difficult to understand. I like, like having a brain injury or OCD. My big idea is that we should all be able, through technology, to pool and share important experiences, both good and bad, to build a stronger form of empathy, from feeling what it's like to be an astronaut walking on another planet to the surreal world of an epileptic. Perhaps all of us being pen pals with Saddam is a little impractical and naive. However, I believe that the social impact of increasing our empathetic exposure could pay off in huge, globally important ways. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Vivek Murthy, and I'm the 19th Surgeon General of the United States. Thank you. Now, when I tell people that I'm Surgeon General, they usually expect me to tell them what to eat and how to exercise, but I'm not going to do that today. Instead, I want you to consider this. If I could tell you that there was one factor in your life that could lower your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke, that could increase your chances of living longer, that could increase your productivity at work and the likelihood that you would get a promotion, and that could even increase your success at losing weight, what would that factor be? It turns out that factor would be happiness. By happiness, I don't mean the satisfaction that comes from indulgence or from hedonism. What I mean, in fact, is the emotional well-being that comes from fulfillment, from social connection, and from love. Happiness affects us on a biological level. It lowers stress hormones as well as inflammatory markers. And in fact, even when you control for smoking, physical activity, and other health behaviors, it turns out hap happier people live longer. Happiness, in fact, is protective. As a doctor, I've cared for many patients over the years with a range of illnesses, from diabetes to heart disease to cancer. But I will tell you that perhaps the most common condition that I have seen is unhappiness. Unhappiness that stems from isolation, from a lack of meaning, and from a loss of self-worth. Now you might wonder, does happiness really lead to better health, or is it the other way around? Do you in fact need health to be happy? And I would tell you that in fact it turns out that only 10% of our long-term happiness is really based on external factors. The remaining 90% is based on how we process life events and circumstances. So can we train our minds to be happy? The answer is yes. We know from research that gratitude, kindness, exercise, meditation, and social connection can be used to cultivate happiness. This can look like taking a few minutes at night to write down what you're grateful for. It can look like making time to eat dinner with your family. Or it can look like taking 15 minutes during the day to exercise or to meditate. So as we grapple with the challenges of how to create a healthier, world and healthier lives, let's remember that happiness is a powerful tool for improving health. Creating more happiness in our lives and in the lives of the people around us could be one of the most important steps that we take to creating a healthier and stronger world. Thank you. I'm Elsa Marie De Silva from Bombay, India, Managing Director of Safe City. My big idea is a world where crowdsourcing and technology drastically reduces one of the biggest pandemics facing us today, sexual violence. This pandemic affects a quarter of the world's population. And yet, we live in a world where we really don't talk about it. It's invisible. Official statistics do not reflect the true nature and size of the problem. We don't talk about it because there's shame and blame involved. There's religion, there's patriarchy and culture involved. And in many cases, there's a loved one involved. At Safe City in India, we have created a platform where women can report their personal experiences of sexual violence anonymously. And since we started over two years ago, more than 5,000 women and girls have shared their experiences. We have used this crowdsourced data to hold institutions accountable. And I believe that we can expand this to the global level. By making it easy for people to report 
and transparently showcasing this data, we can identify factors that lead to behavior that cause sexual violence and help us think through strategies to find solutions. So let us together expose this violence and its causes and make it completely unacceptable. Because today, in the 21st century, it is truly a shame that we are still talking about sexual violence. Thank you. Hi, my name is Monsef Slawi, and I'm the chairman of GlaxoSmithKline's Global Vaccine Division. Uh, the recent, most recent, and largest Ebola outbreak was rapid and devastating. Unfortunately, thousands died, and even this country could have come to a halt. As a community, and as a company in particular, we reacted to try and help. We did our best, but it was at a huge cost. At GSK, we stopped our R&D project, and we tried to make a vaccine against Ebola. We did in six months what we normally do in six or seven years, and the vaccine is now tested in collaboration with the NIH in Africa. But frankly, that level of disruption is unsustainable. We were late, we were not ready as a community. We need a big idea. Here is the big idea. We suggest that we need to become more strategic and more proactive. We need to systematically discover and develop vaccines against a long list of outbreak pathogens that are known. We need to stockpile these vaccines so we can have them before the outbreaks hit us again. How can we do that? We propose to create a dedicated research organization that we co-localize within our R&D organization. We propose to transfer to that organization all our validated technologies, our know-how, and those technologies took decades and billions to, uh, to produce and to make. We propose to transfer them for free. We propose to hire and train scientific staff for that organization to make, discover, and develop vaccines according to a priority list that a third party organization, an independent body should uh, identify. We estimate that actually a team of 150, science, 150 scientists that access our, our technology would be able to discover and develop vaccines, more or less one vaccine every two to three years from that long list. And if needed, this organization can produce hundreds of thousands or a few million doses of the vaccine. What do we ask for? All we ask for is that governments and funding agencies support the running cost, only the running cost, of that organization. We are in discussions with the relevant Human and Health Services Agency, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with various governments in Europe, and this is progressing. We hope to make it happen as soon as possible. We also hope that other vaccine companies will step in, step up, and uh, propose the same. The world's health is at stake. We need a big idea and we need to make it happen. Thank you. My name is Eva Fattorini. I'm a medical doctor and I'm chair of Cleveland Clinic Global Arts and Medicine Institute and founder of Artocene. When we speak about global in contemporary healthcare, we really think to focus we have to focus on our similarities and try to embrace and respect our differences, which after all should not be that difficult because we are so small under the stars. Think about it. And you know, by the way, we are 96% chimpanzees in our genome. You know, last time when we shared the, the genome and the ancestry with our friends, monkeys, was five to seven million years ago. What changed? since five or seven million years ago. Well, we humans always want to improve human condition. And the way to do it is to bring humanities to healthcare. What is really different in healthcare? What is the value of the healthcare? How do we measure it? We do measure the outcomes. We do measure the shortening length of stay. But what really, really matters are human emotions. We believe that bringing arts in a professional way and integrating arts and medicine does that. I was very privileged for last decade to work with not only audacious, but very empathetic and humane leadership, both in the United States and United Arab Emirates. And we proved that words such as love and compassion and beauty and truth do belong to healthcare, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from. 
We proved that art in hospital is not a luxury or commodity. It's actually a very humble necessity in the places where joy and sorrow meet and where human spirit needs to be uplifted. Let's be realistic. We probably want, but do want, but we will not be able to deploy all the beautiful innovations that we are having today. But what we can do, we have to create a model of humanities all around the world. The way to do it is, here's the big idea. Let's build the hospital of the future, an exemplar that is going to be built on a premise of integrating all different forms of arts in the hospital. Let's find the right people, let's find the place, let's just do it. When Winston Churchill was asked to cut arts funding in favor of war efforts, you know what his answer was? Then what are we fighting for? Thank you. I'm Karan Chopra, and I am a social entrepreneur. My last venture was an agriculture business in Ghana, which is where I grew up. My big idea is what I call the explosive combination, combining agents of innovation with agents of scale. All over the world today, we have social entrepreneurs in the trenches. They are inventing, failing, learning, recreating, bringing new ways of thinking to hard problems in hard places. They are agents of innovation. But most of their impact is remembered as drops in the ocean. On the other hand, we have agents of scale. We have governments, we have large businesses, we have stewards of large capital. They have distribution, they have R&D, they have balance sheet power, they have access to talent. But they are very seldom homes of creativity. So how do we plug these innovators into scale providers? So imagine the world of technology. We all have apps, but for the apps to realize their full potential and to reach millions, they need to plug into an operating system. In many ways, our social enterprises today are analogous to these apps, but what are the operating systems for change and who is building these? In my last venture, we produced about 10 million kilos of rice, which is enough to feed about 200,000 people every year in Ghana. But that is only 2% of the need in Ghana, let alone the region. So what if I could plug into government to attract talent from the farming school of the future that governments built, just not for Ghana, but for the region? What if I could co-write my business plan with a large food company and plug into their manufacturing, their marketing, their nutrition experts, their food scientists. How much further could we have gone? In all that you do, I urge you to think about what are the operating systems for change. Because combining agents of innovation with agents of scale will accelerate the impact that we also desperately seek. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Larry Brilliant, and I chair the Skoll Global Threats Fund. One of our projects is to stop pandemics in our lifetime. And we're really making great progress on that. You may not know that from the Ebola outbreak, from MERS. You wouldn't know that if you lived in Mary County in Louisiana, where there's been an outbreak of fear and panic because of a fake epidemic that originated from hackers in the Soviet Union in a group called the Agency. What's different? Over the next few days, we're gonna be talking about pandemics on several different panels. We're gonna be talking about point of care diagnostics and early detection. We're gonna talk about vaccines. I wanna talk about all those things. I think we can stop pandemics in our lifetime. But if we don't, if one organism gets through it will enter into a world unlike any world that a pandemic organism has entered into before. A world of 20 million tweets a day about that organism. A world of fear and panic. In some cases, whipped up by people who stand to make a financial or political gain. I think we're winning the war against the pathogens. I'm not so sure how well we're doing 
against the virus of bad data and bad bugs together. If you're interested in those, a group at TED Med is trying to put together interested people to talk about both of these. If you're interested in stopping the pandemic of pathogens or stopping the pandemic of fear and panic over the next few days, please come and talk to me. Thank you very much. I, unfortunately, am not giving a big idea. I have to attempt to follow the big ideas that were just given. Can everyone please join me in giving our big ideas presenters another round of applause? Good evening, everyone. I'm Britta Stevenson, and I'm the program director for Spotlight Health. I have a, just a couple additional items to go over uh, before we adjourn to the Dor Hosier Center for our welcome reception, which, which has um, copious amounts of Colorado food and beverages. There are a number of very important partnerships that have made Spotlight Health a reality, and more broadly, the Ideas Festival. And that, first and foremost, is our partnership with The Atlantic. The Atlantic Magazine has been our partner since day one, which was more than 11 years ago. And so um, David Bradley, Bob Cohn, James Bennett, and the crew at The Atlantic, thank you for being such wonderful partners with us. We cherish this partnership immensely. We also have a number of official supporters that have made Spotlight a reality. So I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge our 2015 Spotlight Health underwriters. They have spent a lot of time with us over the last 10 months working to make this program a reality. And uh, we are very grateful for your support and collaboration. Those organizations include Anschutz Medical Campus, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Booz Allen Hamilton, HCN, the Mayo Clinic, Mount Sinai Health System, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the American Medical Association, Autism Speaks, Children's National Health System. You guys are good at this. The Association of American Medical Colleges. I only have four more. The CDC Foundation. Consumer Reports. Genentech. And last but certainly not least, the Rockefeller Foundation. So as you now know from, from what Walter mentioned um, when, he, when he opened us up, we aim to be very nimble with the programs that we create at Spotlight Health, hence you know, our pop-up late-breaking session on the Supreme Court's ruling today that will be tomorrow morning. You will also note that there will be additional sessions that, that we create and pop up, if you will, and the best way to keep up to date on what those sessions are is on our app. And I didn't bring my phone up here because I didn't want to have any sort of interference, but on your phone or your iPad or on our website. There are all sorts of um, push notifications that we send, updates, so if you haven't yet downloaded the app, please do so, and allow for push notifications, uh, which allow us to basically let you know in real time what's happening on campus. We also have, uh, just as another way for those of you who may not uh, prefer to stay up to date that way, we also have printed updates that we will have in our large venues every morning, so feel free to grab one of those and just take a look and see what the changes or additions might be for that day. Remember that we're also providing you with the opportunity to check out the gorgeous city of Aspen. We have many official spotlight events in town that you were all invited to attend, and they're all listed in the agenda, never fear, or on the app. Check out our Med School 201 series, which is a redux of our highly successful Med School 101 from last year. Those all take place at the Limelight Hotel. We have a number of events that take place at the Hotel Jerome and also Belly Up. 
I think most importantly, um, take all of this in. This is a really special place with a lot of really important and very caring people. As Peggy mentioned, we have spotlight guests who have flown in from almost every continent. I think I, think I can probably say every continent at this point. Go to sessions that you know nothing about. Push the envelope a little bit. That's all right. Pushing is good. Ask lots of questions. Drink a lot of water. <laughs> Learn, engage, listen, and enjoy yourselves. We are absolutely delighted to have you all here and are thankful that you've, you've chosen to spend your very, very valuable time with us here in Aspen these couple days. Welcome very, very warmly to Aspen Ideas Festival Spotlight Health.